Hey there YouTube, I'm Ikitsu, this is the Ikitsu Times, welcome to my channel, welcome to a Tuesday talk show. So we're done Persona, and uh, we're going to be well and truly past that. Uh, for the time being, I might come back to it later when more stuff comes out, or when I go through it, if I find anything substantive that uh, changed my opinion about things. Um, it is actually a game where I think the second playthrough really does change your perception about everything that's going on in there, because after all, you are essentially playing the entire first nine, like, like nine tenths of the game as a jailer which is extremely um it really sort of changes how everything else is framed but uh yeah I, i'd have to sort of get through it again to figure out exactly what that all means to me but in any event we're talking a little bit about uh literary analysis and critique this time because i think that talking about one of those theories is going to help inform you guys a little bit about my uh, methods of thinking and i think that always helps when i talk about that when i'm doing things like reviews and when i'm talking about games and so on and so forth uh this week I want to talk about the concept of death of the author, and this is actually a theory that I think is a bit polarizing right now. I think that it's been gaining in popularity since its inception. It was extremely unpopular with a lot of people like during what during the 60s, I think, um, and, and up until further in. But it's starting to find some real traction, but at the same time it's finding some real backlash against it. I think there are some people who are really vehemently against it. Um, personally, I'm mostly against it, but I'm not quite as vehemently against it as some of its main main detractors out there. Um, but in any event, let's start off by talking about what uh, Death of the Author is conceptually and why it's sort of used. So, first of all, we have to consider that the historic context of it is that when we are analyzing a body of works, we don't necessarily have a clear vision or a clear idea about what the author's intent was. And this was especially true back when... Um, the theory was first written, they were talking about uh, authors who would be often very difficult to get access to. You wouldn't be able to just phone them up or anything like that. Nowadays, we've got like their personal blog where they can discuss things with us. They could do Q&A. We could tweet them. Um, there's a lot of ways for us to come into contact with authors to try and figure out what's going on in a body of work. Um, but even then, um, they also have the discussion about people who are literally dead. Authors who are literally dead cannot be contacted for the point of uh, figuring out and clarifying what they meant. And similarly, they also discuss how there's also discussion about how authors don't necessarily know their own intentions in a story, or they don't necessarily articulate certain themes or ideas, or they include certain ideas, but they don't necessarily have any themes attached to it, but it still clearly articulates that idea or theme. And there's a sort of a lot of different things that could happen that cause an author to sort of even change their perception about what their own work means, or they could simply just, you know, not remember what they had intended something to mean at the time, even if they had intended it to be meaningful. So an author's intention doesn't necessarily stick with an author throughout time, and is especially difficult to glean once that author dies. So it becomes useful to go into a body of work and analyze it entirely through the lens of that body of work without any sort of outside uh, factors. And for a lot of books, especially where the author is dead, this is kind of the only way that we can analyze those works because we don't have a historical context or a personal context from that author uh, to actually more thoroughly analyze the work and understand what they intended or what they meant by certain things or what the themes in it are. We can get some historical context and I think that we should never abandon the concept even in those situations of figuring out what the circumstances of the author were because they will inject some of their uh, own personal experiences into a story. The saying is of course write what you know and what people know is what they experience in their lives and in their time. Um, so I think that there's never a point where we completely eliminate the author from the equation, even in those circumstances, but there are certainly people who think that we should. Uh, the other element to this is that uh, the body of work should be able to speak for itself and that the author's intention doesn't trump what is actually in the work in, in, in and of itself there. So if there is certain themes and certain ideas and certain patterns in a book, it doesn't matter if the author intended them to be in there or not. They're in there, and that's the sort of final say. Now, this is sort of the stronger uh, version of it, where the author, even if he has a specific intent, and we do know what that intent is, and we can figure that out, and we can sort of analyze the book through that lens, that doesn't matter. What matters is what is in the book, and the entire duty and entire power of interpretation lies in the audience, in the reviewer, in whoever is reading the work. So... This is essentially a theory that fully empowers the uh, audience rather than the writer or the creator uh, to understand or analyze or uh, cr expand upon the works there. And I think that one of the reasons that it's becoming more popular in uh, in the modern day is because there are so many fan works uh, out there. There are so many people who want to be able to contribute to a, a series or uh, 
you know, it, it, it's sort of to the extent where people who were dissatisfied with a book uh, back in, in olden times might have written a book that they thought was better, but they, generally speaking, wouldn't use the same characters. But that's not the case anymore, where people and fans of something are dissatisfied with a work. They tend to actually just try to write around it. Now, admittedly, I do would say that 99% of those rewrites by the fans are trash, because they're usually not good writers um, and they don't usually understand why the book was written the way it was and why their version of it doesn't really necessarily hold up but that's sort of an aside the reality is that people uh, take the sort of um, audience ship of a work as being a major part of that work there's you know major fandoms out there there's major sort of get-togethers for people who appreciate a work and sort of analyze it and dissect it really really carefully and who are just intensely passionate about it uh, who are not necessarily talented writers in their own right but uh, still want to be able to have the book uh, or work end in the same way that they want it to or follow a vision that they want it to or follow themes that they want it to uh, that aren't in there and um, I think that death of the author as a theory sort of empowers that sort of mindset and that idea. So I think that that's sort of one of the reasons why it's becoming more popular these days. It sort of fits with the general sort of um, zeitgeist of the times here. That's that's redundant. I just need to say zeitgeist. Um, and gives people the ability to interpret works how they want to without being contradicted by, you know, reality. And that sort of brings me to my first major complaint about the idea of death of the author. It's basically the concepts that someone's interpretation of the text has to be just as correct as the author's take on it because the author doesn't have any real uh, authority on what the text actually means. Um, I sort of take uh, umbrage with that sort of concept and that general idea there. I do think that the author has more authority as to what the context of the story actually is. Now, what people try to argue is that the text itself contains the entirety of the message and the entirety of the story, and in that they are correct. The problem is that when we look at the processes involved in unpacking that, we invariably hit some sort of human uh, entity that is going to do the interpreting. It's going to sort of analyze it. And the problem with this is that if we talk to the critic about what the story actually means rather than the author, well, now we're looking at the text not as itself. We're looking at the text as filtered through that particular critic. And the same occurs if we read the book ourselves, if we analyze the book ourselves. It's now going through the filter that is our own mind, which is filled inherently with biases and preconceptions and all of this other nonsense that's going to get in the way of actually figuring out what the text in and of itself is about. Humans are extremely good at finding patterns in things and meaning in things that don't have any patterns or don't have any meanings. And so when we actually try to analyze these works of our on our uh, on our own we're going to sort of find messages that are not actually in there um, and what's worse is going to be the cases where that message actually is in there but it's going to be put in isolated pockets and the only way that we can do that is by connecting those isolated pockets of text or subtext or uh, symbolism together in a way that sort of ignores all the things that go in between it so it's possible for us to then say that yes this is in the book and then defend that position intelligibly but the problem is that it only sort of works if you ignore every other counter message that's in there and Generally speaking, we're very good at brushing aside information that does not adhere to what we're trying to say or trying to uh, believe. And because of all of this, what we end up with is a situation where we cannot actually get a pure representation of what is in the text. The themes, the ideas, the characterization, the uh, motivations, all of that stuff has to be filtered through at one point some, some human's brain. And because of this, there's no real point in saying that the text in and of itself is the absolute authority because we can't access that. Um, the text as an absolute authority on its own is not something that can actually, like if the book could get up and tell us what it's about, that would be absolute textual intent. But that can't happen because stories aren't sentient. They aren't their own thing. They're something that we as people pass along to one another, bringing with it our sort of own emotional ideas and themes and, and baggage. So when a critic has a particular idea about something, they're not describing the text in and of itself. They're not sort of giving you a pure view into it. They're giving you their interpretation of it, which has gone through the filter that is their preconception, their notions, their ideas. And so when they say death of the author because they're using the pure text, that doesn't really hold 
true. Um, they're using their the text as a whole plus their brain. If I use the author's intent, I'm using the text as a whole plus the author's brain. And I think you can sort of see why I generally trend towards the author rather than to the critic or the theorist or the reader. Um, now, yes, the thing is the author can be wrong about their own work. There can be works that have explicit messages and consistent themes and consistent symbolisms and consistent messages uh, and characters and motivations that the author themselves didn't intend to be in that work and, they, and, and to which they themselves are blind to. Um, and this happens in particular with unskilled writers, but... Typically speaking, um, if you approach a work as though the author's intent and their intended meaning and their historical background and their uh, the context of their the author's life uh, all holds as being relevant to the text itself, you're going to have a much better starting point than if you sort of don't buy into that sort of idea that the author has sort of some sort of intended reason uh, for writing that story, uh, a motivation behind it, um, an idea, a theme, a characterization, a motive. Um, any of that thing that you, any of the information that you can get from the author should be taken as being gold for when you are going to analyze a work. And obviously, yes, there are going to be plenty of times where the author's opinion about, a, about what the ideas, the themes, the message of a story is, is completely inaccessible to you. They didn't leave any notes about that sort of thing. They didn't have any conversations about it that have been recorded in confidence. Uh, they, they might not have uh, told anybody what the story was actually about to their dying day. And in that particular case, yes, it becomes important for us to understand how to analyze a text with the lens of the the death of the author. But we have to realize that it's not the pure text that we're accessing here. It's the uh, text as filtered through a human brain. And that brain is going to add in a lot of junk to it as it's filtering it out. And it's going to sieve a lot of the content that is in there out of it as it goes through that brain as well. Um, so generally speaking, it's that sort of inability to actually accomplish what it's setting out to do that really makes me really criticize uh, Death of the Author as a meaningful means of analyzing literature or, or video games or anything like that. Simply because, again, it's not seeking to do something that is materially possible. So the other sort of minor concern that I have with uh, the idea of the death of the author is actually kind of weird in that I, I view it as our default state. If we're not going to critically analyze a work, if we're not really going to try to understand a work in its fullness, the default state actually is death of the author. It's not a critical theory. It's simply the default way in which we analyze media. If you go to somebody who watches movies but only watches them very passively, you'll often find them, for example, in the latest Transformers movie or whatever, um, or other Michael Bay movie. Um, these are people who just sort of watch a movie or play a game or read a book for the experience of having experienced it. They don't really care about the deeper imagery, the themes, the symbolism, or any of that other uh, nonsense that you're going to have someone who's more critical of the series as a whole um, go in and try and get. So these people don't care what the author's intent of the series is. They're not going to care that the author intended this to symbolize that. They're not going to care that the main theme is hope. They're not going to care that the characterizations and motivations of these characters collides with some sort of other element to their character. Um, they simply don't care about that. They just want to sort of understand the characters at a very baseline level. They want to know what their basic motivations are. Um, and, you know, they, they want to know what their explained motivations are, essentially. Uh, they want to sort of see them move and progress through the story in whichever way they're going to, and they want to see the events unfold and maybe some nice explosions along the way. Uh, and that is your, your your typical sort of passive audience member. And if there are themes in these, they're going to take them away if they're extremely obvious. If there are more subtle themes, maybe they'll latch onto them, maybe they won't, and maybe they're simply going to inject their own personal opinions into the work. What they're not going to do is go over it from a fine tooth comb from multiple different angles. They're not going to consult with the author of the work. They're not going to talk to um, you know, Stanley Kubrick as to what he, the hell he meant about The Shining. Um, you know, all of that sort of stuff is not going to go through the heads of the average person who is going to watch your typical sort of movie or read your typical book or play your typical video game. What they want is to sort of just experience it and have fun with it. And even for your average reviewer or critic, they're not necessarily going to ask the author what they intended or what they meant. They're not going to look through theses or uh, read 
the notes or memoirs of the creator. They're not going to do any of this sort of stuff in coming to their conclusion about that work. They're going to em emphasize their own theories and their own ideas about the work, even at the expense of the author's opinion. That's just sort of how people by default tend to do things. Um, and part of this is because, generally speaking, the author's intentions and the author's ideas are not necessarily easily accessible to us, and also because a lot of people are lazy. Now, there are exceptions to that, of course. There are people who are going to say that, well, the author intended it to mean these particular themes, so we're going to analyze our review or our critique from that lens. And there are going to be audience members who get captivated by something even though they're just the average joke uh, audience member and they're going to see a movie five or six more times after the first time and they're going to really deeply analyze what they're seeing from it um like uh i i for example am not a movie watcher i don't really go to movies but there are certain things that i watch more times um and and watch them over and over and over again and sort of get a better understanding from it from each particular watching uh, i'm not going to go into any examples right now but uh let's just say that it's mostly neon genesis evangelion um anyway so there are definitely times where people will break that mold but the general understanding is that we're not going to actually care about what the uh, author actually intended from their original work. We don't know what their themes are, we don't know what the motives of the characters are, we don't know the historical context of the writer during that part of their life. Um, even though it's incredibly useful and informative to know what the sort of context of when the story was written and what was happening when that story was written, you know, that helps us uh, understand the themes and ideas of books incredibly well uh, in, in most cases. Uh, after all, they do say, write what you know. But despite that, the default state for people really is just to go ahead and analyze books from whatever perspective we happen to have at the time using the text only. And because this is the sort of default non-critical way that we analyze works, I don't particularly view it as a useful critical tool. There are already tons of people and tons of voices out there who are looking at it through this lens, and while they're not necessarily dissecting the movie at an incredibly uh, ferocious level, I actually think that taking the surface of the movie the book, the video game, and saying that this is what it's about by just skimming the surface is generally speaking going to lead us to far, far fewer errors in judgment when we're trying to talk about themes and ideas and concepts. Because if it's easy enough that we can get it from the main sort of skimming off of the surface, then it's clearly there. Then it's a very obvious theme. It's a very obvious idea. If we try to dig any deeper than that, we're much, much more likely to sort of inject our own biases or prejudices into the work as we're sort of going. And because of this, I think that if we're going to look at Death of the Author, there's already too many people who are analyzing works in that lens to make it really functionally useful. And if we want to really get at the heart of something, I think that if we're going to be the sort of person who critically analyzes it, yes, use the body of work, use it without any other outside interference, read the book first, and then look at other people's opinions about it. Because the only way to get that uncolored, unbiased opinion about it, or not even unbiased, but un... Uh, un altered sort of opinion of a work is to experience it firsthand without any other sort of outside uh, expectation do that first but then also go at it from the angle of the author because the author is going to have a very authoritative uh, voice when it comes to their work um, because again we're trying to say that a person who um, well, let, let's just say it like this. If you want to critically analyze a work, you have to come at it from as many different angles as possible, not just keep drilling at it through the same angle and through the same lens that you've already been predisposed to look at it through. If the only way that you're willing to look at a work is through whatever sort of inherent biases you've already injected into it, you're not really going to get a critical analysis of the book. You have to look at it from all of these other perspectives and be able to rationally debunk each of them or be forced to accept each of them as it happens to stand. And that's ultimately what you're going to have to do. So I don't think that Death of the Author really makes sense from a, an overall literary critical perspective. Um, I think that it's sort of the first pass that we do of any sort of medium that we encounter. So that's sort of the secondary complaint. And it's much, much less uh, significant than the first complaint, in my opinion. Because, I mean, yeah, it means that we are actually doing it. And it does have sort of a utility in the way that we analyze and critically uh, approach media. Um, it's our first pass into uh, a more critical analysis in general. And it could be the uh, means by which we arrive at our more critical approach later down the line. But I do think it is less serious a concern than simply saying that, you know, if we're trying to analyze the text um, on its own merits, that that's impossible. I think that that's a much greater concern for the theory. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my uh, opinion about uh, Death of the Author.
And I mean, this is partly a rant against uh, Death of the Author as it's actually applied. The actual theory as uh, written by Barthes is slightly different, but ultimately leads me to the same conclusions. So it's not a huge divergence from that. But um, I do find that it, it is also slightly misused these days to a certain extent. But in any event, uh, that's our Tuesday talk show for today. I um, hope you found this one enjoyable. And of course, as always, I hope to see you guys all next time.